This is um, the American Congress, and this is the second module for the week of March 8th to March 12th. And what I want to do, the material that I'm essentially going to discuss in this lecture, in this module, is Chapter 3 of the Davidson, Olsek, Lee, and Schickler book. And in the next module, uh, I'll complete this discussion with uh, Chapter 4. Next week, we'll turn to Chapter 5 of the Davidson and Olsek book and um, and the Robinson article, the three, three faces of congressional media. Um, so if you have the notes, uh, here's what I want to do to link the uh, discussion you've had of the framers' intentions for Congress, especially the discussion of representation uh, that we looked at in Madison's defense of the House of Representatives um, in the 50s papers, and then lay out a framework for incorporating uh, that discussion with um, uh, the material in Chapter 3 by suggesting there are four dimensions of representation. Our question is, is uh, what's representation? And as we saw from the beginning of our class, when I asked you if you thought that Congress was representative of the American people, and some of you responded, um, um, where did that come from? Um, anyway, um, so uh, most of you responded negatively, but again, the whole point is to uh, not only to analyze the way this institution works and how it evolved, which we've already looked at, or rather how it was designed and how it evolved, but to raise the fundamental analytical question, which then becomes an evaluative question, um, how is it performing its core functions? And again, as I uh, suggested from the beginning of the class, the American people tend to argue not very well. It, and certainly, by the way, and remember following Davidson and Olizek, the two Congresses, there's the Congress that's an assembly of representatives, and then there's the Congress, which is an institution of legislators. And so that's how I organize this course. And, and so again, what we're after in this discussion is what is representation, what are its elements, and what does it mean to say that the Congress is or isn't representative of the American people? How would you know? And um, um, and for this, by the way, I used to use in this course, and I just decided because we lost two weeks to drop one of my favorite authors. And it's kind of damning when you admit that, that you have political scientists who are your favorite authors. That's like saying I like to read um, uh, sewer manuals or something like that. But there were two great political scientists, one of whom we, more than two, by the way, but, but there, I think in this last 40 years, there were two great political scientists who wrote boring but interesting, how's that for an oxymoron, groundbreaking works on Congress. Uh, Douglas Arnold, The Logic of Congressional Action, and I just decided that, um, that uh, because of time, I just dropped those materials in, and, and most of the points I'm going to try to make that Arnold would make, we'll use in Fenno. And, and remember, we're looking at, so chapter five of Davidson and Olsek and Lee and Strickler, D-O-L-S, um, is actually a kind of a digest of uh, Fenno's groundbreaking study of home style. And then we're going to read some s excerpts from it a little bit on um, before we turn to the latest iteration of um, Fenno's work, which is uh, our work on um, the... Let me just hold it for you. Um, this expensive hardcover book, The Challenge of Congressional Representation, which is an amplification of some of his reflections on congressional reputation in the end of home style, as you'll see. And, and, uh, it's, and so I'm going to ask political scientists to come forward and tell us what they know. And on this question, by the way, uh, is Congress representative? Um, uh, Remember, uh, in Chapter 3 of Davidson and Olizek and in our initial discussion, the, the question of how representative or non-representative Congress is became a question of whether Congress looks like a mirror image of the American people, demographically, gender, and all these other things. Um, and, of course, the answer is that it doesn't. It looks more like that now, but it doesn't, never has. And then, of course, does that mean? And this was where your instincts were in that discussion that, of course, it's not representative. Uh, now, of course, this is one of the reasons why I had you read Madison, 
because Madison argues that's not what representation means. That's not how you get there. And in some ways, that's almost a peripheral consideration. That's not the question to ask. Uh, if the body is representative or not representative of the American people, the question to ask is not whether it looks like the American people. Well, then what is representation? Well, I'm going to go back to and start off with Madison's definition that I highlighted in our discussion of the founding and use that to structure our discussion. And, and so, by the way, let me, and then how are the political scientists going to do this, especially Mr. Fenno, Richard Fenno. Um, Fenno did something very interesting in home style. He kind of did what Jane Goodall did with the chimps in Africa. She went and lived with them. So this guy actually, as you'll see, because I, uh, I included the appendix from the original edition of home style, where he actually went around and followed and observed members of Congress at both in Washington and their districts. So he went and lived with the chimps and saw how they behave and then wrote a very interesting book, which is a, I guess I'll, I'll spoil the beans. It's a kind of a weak affirmation of the representative nature of Congress, but I'll try to lead you up to that and to see what, uh, why you can plausibly make that argument. Um, and, and so with respect to the political scientists, um, I'm an institutionalist as a political scientist. I tend to study the structures and development of institutions plus their organizing principles, constitutional theory, and it's that. I'm not an empiricist as say Dr. Talman is who studies raw data. And you have to remember that uh, that, that kind of political science, social science in general, kind of evolved after World War II. How and why? One, um, the statistical methods for agglomerating and teasing out um, generalizations from data became more sophisticated. The science of statistics, which kind of began in bits and pieces of modern mathematics in the 1700s and 1900s, it kind of made some important steps. That was the first thing. Second, um, computers, uh, those little number crunchers that once used to be as big as Carmichael Hall, ENIAC, or UNIVAC, developed by IBM, and now, of course, are as small as your rich rot and smarter than your Congress professor. Um, but computing um, made it possible then to crunch large amounts of data. And of course, the other thing is, is political scientists, social scientists began through surveys and polling to generate large bodies of data, which then can be crunched by. Com so, I mean, the rise of statistical or empirical political science was part of the development of political science and social science in some ways as part of the 20th century. And uh, it isn't that I can't count or can't do statistical methods, although that wasn't my best class in graduate school, we must confess. Um, one problem is, is that when you think about it, what kinds of political data are uh, the massive agglomeration, or I should say just large amounts of data, then using statistical models and analyzed under computerized methods of crunching them, um, what kinds of what kind of data are useful for studying one institutions? It's not great for studying the presidency because the presidency consists of forty six historical individuals, um, uh, which is a pretty low sample set. Um, and uh, and the judiciary there there was in the sixties and seventies and eighties an attempt to do statistical studies of judicial decisions and try to see. Uh, hidden dimensions of ideology and consistency by scalogram analysis. I had to learn how to do all that. But I find it much more interesting reading the opinions of John, the judges than counting their votes and seeing statistical patterns, which I don't think actually revealed much about the judiciary. Yes, it revealed who were the most liberal ones and conservative ones, as those terms are superficially and um, broadly thrown about. But of course, if you think about it, um, when it comes to the study of Congress, there are two aspects of the congressional environment and operation which are malleable or amenable to being statistically studied. Excuse me, that's my phone. Hold on one second. Where was I? That was my doctor calling. I'm not feeling particularly well, so I'm not going to go to services tomorrow. Now you know. All right, so um, what was I talking about? Oh, yes, political science and studying institutions. So. Um, it turns out that two dimensions of Congress's environment are amenable to statistical study of uh, large amounts of data, or at least, um, and that is one in the electoral environment, public polling, 
and and um, election analysis. Although in the last election, that uh, industry seemed to have had some of its successes in qualifications question, um, but um, but especially electoral behavior, voting studies, um, and and some of that, by the way, shows up in Chapter Four of Davidson and Olizik and Lee and Schickler. Um, in terms of studying how voters behave. And we'll refer to that uh, in the next module when we talk about um, uh, uh, the electoral environment and voting behavior. So um, the other dimension of congressional uh, operation, which is amenable to study to large agglomerations of data, are roll call votes because in 19, I think 20, Two or perhaps a little bit later on in the 20s, Congress, the House of Representatives installed an electronic system of voting where each desk has a red, white, and green button. Red for no, green for yes, and white for abstain. Uh, because roll call voting used to take hours in the House, obviously, 435 members, and then this system, and then if you visited the House, and, and many state chambers, have now the same thing, especially um, uh, in uh, uh, larger bodies, the, the the House of Representatives in the state level, and um, and the, there's a, a, gr a grid of names and lights, and that records votes instantly. So it became possible then, with recorded roll call votes, um, to study the voting behavior of members of Congress, and so. Um, uh, Arnold, by the way, in the logic of congressional action, tries to combine those and create a model of predicting congressional behavior, um, which again, uh, I'm not using in this semester. And then Fenno, as you're gonna see, carried congressional observation and empirical data to a different level and created a different kind of uh, empirical observation of Congress, which we'll turn to next week. And, um, and so, by the way, on the question of representation, the initial findings of uh, set aside whether or not there's a comparable percentage of blacks or Jews or women or lawyers or, or, or whatever in, in Congress, the initial studies of the representational link was not, were, not, were not promising. And how did they do that? So in the 50s and 60s, uh, what uh, political scientists did was they created, they created six dimensions of national policies foreign affairs, foreign aid, um, uh, welfare, state, um, commer I don't know, commercial regulation, all kinds of things like that. So six broad areas. And they began polling people uh, to in congressional districts to see how they voted. And then they compared the roll call votes. They organized not only people's voting according to these six, typically that was several studies, six categories, but, um, but then also they uh, categorized the roll call votes of members of the House. And what they found was a pretty low, lower than chance, uh, correlation between public opinion polling in districts and the voting behavior of Congress, of members of Congress. And so that the initial results on this kind of study was that Congress isn't a particularly representative institution. That, that because clearly the implication of the study is, is that if Congress represented, and by the way, this you could even say does kind of harmonize with Madison's understanding of what representation is, intimate sympathy through immediate dependence. Um, we'll come back to that definition again, and I pointed it out to you when we read The Federalist. Uh, you could say, well, that's a pretty weak read, uh, and that, that therefore once pe members of Congress get into Congress, um, they, they desert the opinions and, and preferences of their members um, of their districts. Well, it turns out that over the decades, that's been nuanced a little bit more, both in terms of uh, um, uh, Arnold's framework, which we're not considering in this class. But as you're going to see, Fenno somewhat corrects that, uh, that uh, assumption. So by the way, I guess you could even pu push our question, is Congress representative or isn't it representative? Uh, and and this, what I just mentioned, this kind of studies from the 50s saying, um, you could turn it how reflective of uh, changes in public opinion, at least changes of public opinion in their districts, are members of Congress. And it may be that this kind of uh, uh, dividing voters up by these categories and measuring public opinion polls, and then um, uh, and then 
uh, uh, categorizing the votes of members of Congress isn't perhaps the best way to study that link. Nevertheless, it helps us become a little more reflective about that. So if you're looking at the notes, what I'd like to do is, is, is again, what we're looking for in the next two weeks is um, we're looking to see the answer to the question of what is representation, what does it consist of, and especially under the conditions of the contemporary Congress, what's the link between members of Congress and the people they claim to represent? Is there a link? And should we as Americans be encouraged by um, the way we are represented in Congress, or should we be discouraged by uh, the failure of Congress to represent us? Look at the notes. Um, this is Roman number one. An organizing framework for this discussion. What is representation? How do we know if the American people are being represented in Congress? What I just went on and on and on about. Now, this is Povorty speaking. So, um, summarizing uh, the material that we have looked at in Madison and the Founders, and looking forward to the material in chapters uh, three and four of Davidson and Olzik. Um, uh, which is essentially the electoral environment and then the campaign environment in chapter four. And then chapter five for next week, as you're going to see, is um, is actually, uh, as I mentioned previously, is actually Fenno's Homestyle study. study. His book Homestyle had such a profound effect on the the study of Congress that, that uh, Davidson and Olizek essentially have, have represented his framework as, as part of their presentation of Congress. But it, it had a widespread effect on, on, the, on the study of Congress. So I'm going to argue that there are four aspects or dimensions of representation that will guide our consideration of Congress's representative function and Congress's relative failure or success in embodying and performing that function. Um, these aspects or elements of representation are rooted in what we saw in Madison's discussion of representation in Federalist 52 and 58 and in chapters three and four of the OLS, and chapters five and Homestyle, which we will look at beyond that. And then beyond that, I think in two weeks now, we'll be working through Fenno's new book, The Challenge of Congressional Representation, and we'll use that to summarize this part of the course. So what is representation? First, I would argue, and this is what chapter three of the Davidson and Olzik suggests, is it's a set of physical structures that links the elected official to his or her constituency. Primarily, the first physical structure uh, that, which is a geographical structure, and it's a constitutional structure, is the district. Um, uh, but also aspects of party organizations, PACs, campaign committees, et cetera, that have become part of the contemporary electoral environment. So uh, it's a set of structures. What do structures, institutional structures do? They shape behavior and consciousness. And so you'll see that, for instance, even the question of how to define a district, and as I'll point out when we talk more about this a little bit later on uh, in chapter three, um, the Constitution doesn't mention congressional districts. All it does is assign the number of representatives to a state based upon the proportion of national population that uh, that state has uh, in its population. So strictly speaking, the selection of members of Congress, like South Carolina, that has seven representatives, um, that that could that could be done by districts, which it is, and that is the un nearly universal. It is the universal way of doing it, except for those states like Wyoming and and Mon Montana. There's some tussle between Idaho and Montana, and uh, where states actually do tussle and contest uh, census results. Um, uh, but uh, but those huge states that only have one representative or small states like Rhode Island that only have one representative. Um, but in all the other states, the district is the most local unit or physical structure that, that defines how a representative relates to his or her constituency. Second, and this discussion in some ways reflects back to the nature of institutions that I started the course with. It's a set of procedures that, and this is critical, I'm gonna talk more about this in Rome Normal too a bit, it's a set of procedures that transforms the candidate into something more than a private citizen. Um, and, and that's in Davidson and Olzik's discussion of recruitment, the actual campaign 
both primary and general, those are events, structured events, procedures, which take you and me, and, and um, I'm not trying to insult you by suggesting that you are like me, but we are private citizens, even though I am a professor of political science. Um, but um, you and I live in the world that Madison describes as the world of faction and private, you know, what we know is our personal lives and our business and our, you know, your student life and everything like that. And what you get from Instagram um, uh, as a representation of the outside. We're just kidding. Um, but um, the, uh, uh, um, but when I say that we're private citizens, members of Congress in going through the process of election have a set of experience, which is, I'll try to be more specific of in, in Roman numeral two, that actually give them a different view of the public good than a private citizen has. And that's part of the tension in the representative function. Um, because um, even in a relatively homogenous district, like say the sixth congressional district of Iowa, which is just across the river from where my parents live in Illinois, um, that's come into the news because the Republican candidate won state certified election by a vote of six votes out of several hundred thousand, six vote margin. And the Democratic candidate um, is contesting it and arguing that the state failed to count 22 ballots, which might have an effect on the election. And the controversy is, is the House does in Article 1, Section 4 has the final uh, and in some degrees in Article 1, Section 5 does have, does ascertain the results of, uh, so they have the final say on whether or not to accept an elected member um, with, within some discretion. And, and so there's some talk about uh, possibly the Democratic majority, which is quite narrow. It's 222. It's been the narrowest it's been in, in decades um, to 211 Republicans. There's some discussion that con Congress may overturn the result of that election. But my point here is is that sixth district of Iowa is a pretty homogenous district. There are no big cities. It's a farm district, and um, and in some ways you could say what's the difference between either one? That Democratic candidate who lost by six votes, or Marjorie Miller Meeks, I think is her name, the Republican candidate who won by six votes. They know and see the world differently than each of the people that voted for them, and that's that process of standing for election which Madison talks about, the refining effect of elections and the preferability of representation over direct democracy. Because with a direct democracy, all you're getting is private opinions jumbled together into a mass assembly like the Assembly of Athens or something like that, or public opinion polling, uh, which means, by the way, that most people answer public opinion polling without having to think about weighing one issue with another. But if you're running for election, you have to talk to different people, even if it's different farmers and different parts of the 6th District of Iowa. Nevertheless, if you come from a heterogeneous district like uh, uh, like Charlotte, by the way, which Charlotte is divided up so that, um, and of course, we're going to talk about apportionment, where within the limits of representation and apportionment based upon states that only have one representative, roughly a representative district today uh, averages between 800 million, uh, 800,000 and a million people. Again, because of that one representative to each state, it can't be exact. Um, but 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 that's a lot of people. And you could say this in a, in a diverse area like Charlotte or even Greenville, Spartanburg, we have two moderately large ur urban areas. Greenville is the uh, fourth largest city in South Carolina and Spartanburg or Florence, I think, are tied for fourth or fifth. Obviously, there's Columbia. I mean, there's Charleston, Columbia, and then either Greenville, and then Sporn, Florence or Spartan. So in other words, the fourth congressional district in, in upper North South Carolina, is a pretty heterogeneous district that includes some rural elements, some urban elements. So does Charlotte for that matter, and the districts drawn around Charlotte. So the point is, if you come from a pretty heterogeneous district to get elected by not even a majority, but a variety of the people, you gotta speak to a lot of different people. And in getting different people to say, vote for me, you have to listen to them. And, that you, and what you listen to is that people have conflicting ideas. And you're more aware of what people think than individuals in their individual capacity. That's the first element, as we'll see in a second, in that transformation of uh, citizen consciousness into representative consciousness.
Third, it's a relationship between the representative and his constituency. Madison says representativeness is intimate sympathy uh, through immediate dependence. Um, you have a sense of the interest, opinions, and passions of your constituents because they directly elect you. And if you want to get elected by them, you have to pay attention to them. It's a result. It's a relationship. Um, and, uh, and in some ways, uh, one thing that Fennell tries to measure, and even Arnold, and and even the Davidson Olszewski is, if if the substance of that relationship isn't simply reflected in a crude public opinion poll or a measurement between a roll call voting in Congress and a public opinion poll in the public, how does that rep? What's the content of that relationship? Where are its elements? How does it form? And we will be examining that. That's partially what Davidson and Olszewski examined in um, in the um, uh, district defining and recruitment process and the campaign. The campaign um, helps to fasten that relationship uh, between the representative and the constituency. And then last, and this is important, and you might come to think that I'm placing too much stress on this. It's a state of mind. It's a subjective perception or orientation that exists in the mind of the representative but which actually determines his or her behavior. This is Arnold and Fennell. Again, uh, since I'm not using Arnold, it, it, Arnold has even more uh, uh, statistical measurements that suggest, uh, that try to measure the inner state of the, inner state of mind of the representative and actually link that um, statistically to um, elections in the constituency. Fennell, again, uh, as you'll see, takes us on a more directive direct Jane Goodall observing the chimps. And here's the point. You behave, your behavior as a human being is shaped by the way you see the world. And one of the things Fennel will make you see is Fennel actually, and this is how he somewhat revolutionized the structure of political science on these things, is he was the first scientist to study what are the perceived constituencies of members of Congress. And we're going to talk a little, a lot about that. So you could say, what did Fennell discover in in hiding in congressional offices and in riding around their district in cars with them and sleeping in hotels with them? And um, he watched what they did and in extensive interviews got into their heads. And in some ways, what Fennell made us see that uh, you could say what his discovery was, was the inner mind of a representative and how it is shaped by the process of election. So. Um, those are the four aspects of representation that we're going to examine in this material, and indeed, uh, that I hope will help you to form your own judgment as to whether Congress is or is not genuinely representative. So uh, turning to Roman numeral two, general considerations regarding the electoral environment. Remember, now I'm just quoting here from, Fe from Federalist 52, Madison's definition of representation, which we've already talked plenty about, which I just referred to. First as it is essential to liberty that the government in general should have a common interest with the people, so it is particularly essential that the branch of it under consideration, which happens to be the House of Representatives, should have an immediate dependence on and an intimate sympathy with the people. Frequent elections are unquestionably the only policy by which this dependence and sympathy can be effectually secured. Um, so. Um, uh, the, um, so what Madison, and, and again, when I teach this in American government, or even as I taught it last week, um, I, uh, I take the elements of that definition and kind of structure them as ends and means. Um, the end or purpose is an intimate sympathy with, which in, uh, subsequently in the other papers, he defines as an understanding and identification with the interests, passions, and opinions of your constituents. And then the means uh, to that is what he calls immediate dependence, which is another phrase for direct election. Because these people have to go out and talk to voters directly and get them to vote for them, immediate dependence, direct election, um, uh, that is how the representative link is fashioned in the mind of the, and the behavior of the representative. And, and by the way, I'll just tip my hat um, that um, uh, uh, to some degree, Fennell uh, and, and Davidson will show that 
oddly enough, something like that really happens. But you can be the judge of that yourself. So remember, in Federalist 10, Madison, in defining the genus of popular government, where public opinion uh, directs the operations of the government, um, uh, he says he says that there are two species uh, of popular government, democracies and republics. And if you remember our discussion, and if you had me for American government, I help you with a mnemonic that, remember, democracy begins with a D, direct, and republic begins with an R, representative. So uh, the difference between a republic and a democracy is that a republic is care the business of government is is uh, carried on by elected representatives and and by the way uh, wh one thing to note here is is that that means that the direction of policy that the, the role of the public um, now becomes not directive but reactive and and one of the reasons I regretted kind of letting go of some of Arnold's material in the uh, in this course in this the logical congressional action is is Arnold has a very precise account of the mechanism by which citizens choose and evaluate policies and how that gets translated into voting for members of Congress. Um, and so um, in some ways, uh, uh, it was almost like an empirical version of what Madison is talking about in Federalist 10. But the point I'm making here is not only does it mean that the representatives make policy instead of the population in person, the role of the public then in constitutional republicanism becomes passive rather than active because there are so many different opinions out there in the factional public that that in a direct democracy like the Athenian assembly whatever passions opinions tend to wave over the direct people the people immediately for better or worse and mostly worse uh, get translated into bad public policy and so um the advantage of republics is this refining capacity. We'll talk more about that in a minute, and I've already adumbrated that to some degree. But um, uh, the other thing is, is, is that the people no longer tell the government what to do actively, which is what it does in a democracy. What, rather, in a republic, the role of the people become passive, and that in some ways the people, elections become um, uh, passive and post hoc to the policy that governments make. And in other words, elections more are a referendum of how things have been done and a projection of what will go into the future uh, than in actively directing public policy. So uh, that's an important thing to remember. And that's one of the reasons why Madison thinks representation is preferable to democracy. And so, uh, but let's then be a little clearer then on, and you'll see this sets up some of the material in Davidson and also chapter three. Uh, why is representation an improvement over raw citizen consciousness? How and why? One, a more select population, this is a little elitist, um, than the general public, background, ambition, even education. Representatives, the, the, uh, the, the, popula the percentage of um, representatives in Congress who have a college education is much higher than the general public which I'm not sure if that is a good thing or bad thing because I've actually seen academics trying to run their lives and it's not a pretty sight. That's why William Buckley was fond of saying that he'd rather be governed by the first 20 names in the Boston phone book than by the government department of Harvard. Here, here. Anyway, they, so you could say, okay, what's the benefit of a college education? Obviously you guys must be persuaded of that since you're paying uh, $2,000 a year to attend a private uh, liberal arts college for women. Um, so you must be possessed of the idea that this is good for you. Well, okay, why is a college education? What does it add to you? Doesn't it add something in terms that might be useful to the relevance or relevant to the formation of public policy? So on one level, what Madison and, and other framers generally thought, look, I mean, uh, poor homeless people are not going to be the ones running for Congress. Generally speaking, the professionals, the businessmen, the, uh, the bankers, the lawyers, uh, and the more educated part of the population will be actually the ones moving into representative institutions. And that has generally been the case and still is the case. And would you want something different? Um, so, and the constitutional qualifications, which are pretty low. Again, what are the qualifications for the House? Um, you have to be 25 years old, 
that's most of you in three years um, or four years or one year or two years. Uh, you have to be a citizen of the United States for seven years and you have to live in the state. And now, of course, with the addition of congressional districts, the unit of representation is even lower. And we'll talk about some of the issues with defining the geographical limits. But one thing that districts do is make that state tie even more intimate. And we're going to see as we compare House and Congress, House and Senate, the, the big differences between these two institutions that endure have to do with the size of the constituency. Members of the House are far more intimately tied to their constituents than members of the Senate uh, for obvious reasons. And more about that when we turn to the Baker book later on. Um, and uh, um, so uh, 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 the Constitution narrows. And by the way, remember, with respect to democracy or democratic representation, Aristotle talks about this in the politics. What would be the most democratic way of electing people? By lot, by lottery. If you think about it, if the aim of a democracy is to make sure that everyone has equal access to political power, wouldn't it be great if people were chosen by lottery rather than uh, elected? Uh, because that would mean that every person in the body politic would have an equal opportunity, regardless of their background, their education, their finances, to be a member of Congress. Do you think that would improve Congress? It might, by the way. Um, but anyway, uh, so uh, there, the, the whole notion of qualifications, which becomes in chapter three, recruitment, narrows down the pool of human beings and supposedly elevates the qualities. Because again, uh, you probably, uh, 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 that's not to say that any 25 year old um, uh, US citizen who's been a citizen for seven years and lives in, in his or her state couldn't or shouldn't run for Congress. But you, it might be elitist to say that Americans actually want a little more from the representatives in Congress than what they would see in their own lives. There's a tension, again, between populism and institutionalism and, and the will of the people and the deliberate sense of the community and institutions. Second, the experience of election. So the question is, the question I'm formulating here is, why is representation better than direct democracy? So one is, is there are more qualified people uh, in uh, Congress or on state legislature, whatever, whatever, because of the reasons we just saw. Second, the very experience of election, running for election, already transforms the consciousness of a, uh, uh, a private citizen. Remember, the great analysis of society in Federalist 10 is that society is factional. Uh, and indeed, the whole aim, if you're in my American political thought course, this is what the diverse, huge national republic was supposed to do. Um, it was supposed to actually increase the number of factions and differences based on economics and religion and geography and opinions and everything like that. Uh, and, and, um, and here's the point. When you say my opinion as a private citizen, I'm looking at it from my little world right here. And, and I'm a professor. Uh, and But if you're a farmer, what's the lens? If you're a doctor, what's the lens, professional lens, that you see it? If you're a, 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 a stay-at-home parent, uh, what's the lens with which you see your world? It's your world of experience. And all of us who may have opinions about how to run the country actually never have to run for office. And that means you and I can espouse our opinions without any modification or moderation, or even, by the way, even um, depth or information. In other words, as we like to say as Americans, you're entitled to your opinion no matter how stupid it is. Okay, I'm not saying that people are stupid in their private lives, but it's clear, for instance, that if you don't read the newspaper, or don't listen to the news, if all you get is, is what your friends said you on Instagram or Twitter um, or Facebook, you have a pretty narrow view of the world and the things that American government has to run the gamut of as is you have to know something about, as Madison points out, by the way, in Federal 52 and in the Senate papers, you actually have to know something more than what people in their private capacity know. And election means, again, if it was lottery, which it might be more democratic on one level, then you could say, I'd go immediately from my private experience into the uh, legislature. But running for election, that means I have to talk to me, and then I have to talk to you, and then I have to talk to the person sitting next to you. And I have to talk to all those 800,000 people in my district. 
Now, it's hard to talk to 800,000 people every two years, as we're going to see. Um, nevertheless, there you can see that running for office transforms what you see and know, if only because even if you're in a relatively homogenous district, like the 6th District of Iowa that I was saying, um, nevertheless, you've got to talk to people of different religions, different social backgrounds, and everything like that. You have to, and your consciousness as a human being is transformed into something broader through the process of election. Um, because most citizens don't have that problem. Like, I don't know, what's the, what's the electoral body that most of uh, people are, well, I knew a guy that did my hair in Spartanburg and that I was friends with, and he ran for school board in Bullying Springs. That was an elective office. Um, and, and then some people run for, um, city council and county council and but and then some people go higher to state office and then even national office so again the point is just undergoing the, it won't turn you into a genius or a psycho not a psychopath a telepath is what i meant to say um and so um just that experience of election transforms the consciousness of a, an elected representative into more than a, a private citizen does this save us from the presence of dolts and idiots and blockheads in Congress? No. Third, the self-interested bond of election and re-election will guarantee representative, but not identity. Again, you're never going to have, and this is Madison uh, responding to your opinions in the first class, you're not going to have the Congress be a mirror image of the American people. Or you might get more or less representative of this group or that group or that gender or that religion or that profession. But that's not, identity is not going to be the link that links the representative to his or her constituency. It's the self-interest of getting elected, and as you're going to see, re-election. Because what all the political scientists tell us is what these creatures, these animals, these election machines crave is, especially once they're in, they desperately want to be re-elected. And as you're going to see, question that shapes up in our minds is, is that desperate desire to be re-elected sufficient to make these people representative of us? There's a fourth element to the superiority of representational consciousness to citizen consciousness, but it is strictly speaking not part of the electoral or representative environment. It's the experience of meeting together and legislating and deliberating in an institutional setting that most citizens never experience. More on this later because that shades into the deliberative or the legislative function, the other Congress. And one of the things that Benno did in his home style, and this survives a little bit in chapter five and, and in his later book, is it turns out that a representative sees and knows things that private citizens don't because they actually have to fashion compromises. They sit on committees, they learn things. And so part of what a representative has to do, and this is part of what uh, Fennell calls home style, is learn how to explain Washington activity to his constituents. Um, and so actually what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to stop for our, uh, and then cover the material. We're just beginning to sort of move into chapter three and four of Davidson and Olozik. So I'll save that for the last module, uh, which will be coming shortly.